The reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. Concerning spiritual gifts. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to dumb idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them, and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit. And he distributes them to each one, just as he determines. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The sheep and the goats. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you, a stranger, and invite you in? or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Lord. 
Lord, I ask you to speak your words through my mouth and bring your message to our hearts. Amen. Please sit. Now that passage from Matthew 25 is a well-known one, and it's often used when we talk about the church's call to social action. Now today we're focusing on the work of Oasis Charitable Trust, which is a large Christian organization all about church social action. So it seemed an appropriate passage for today. St. Nicholas is supporting Oasis as one of our charities in our Outward Giving program. And we have a speaker from Oasis with us, Kat Still. Uh, she'll be speaking to us later about her work, and she'll also be helping me in this sermon. Um, before we do that, though, let's just stand back and look at this passage in its entirety. Jesus is using a metaphor about shepherds separating sheep from goats, and his audience would have seen this many times. I don't know whether you're aware, but goats are less hardy than sheep. So in colder weather and in winter, you have to separate the goats out and put them in a sheltered area. So that's where the analogy comes from. It's very well known as a pastoral image, but Jesus is using it to describe something totally unknown, judgment, and it's very serious stuff. It's a warning that God is concerned about what we do in our spiritual lives and whether we're helping to build his kingdom or not. It's part of the gospel. Faith without works is dead, we read in James. He writes, if you see someone with no food or clothes, don't say, bless you, my child. Do something. Give them what they need. Social action isn't an add-on for churches. It's part of every Christian's daily life. It's part of the gospel. Now, a big question for us in this lovely village in Surrey is how to help people in need. Who are they? Where are they? What is it that they need? And poverty in the 21st century looks very different from the days of Tiny Tim and Charles Dickens. A family who look okay on the outside, they might have a car, mobile phones, might still need a food parcel because they're servicing a crippling amount of debt. Or someone has lost their job and the in their income has cut down drastically. And these people have got their pride too. They're not going to trumpet the fact that they need a food parcel. Also, poverty is not only financial. If we look in verses 35 to 36, Jesus points out very different types of poverty. Yes, there is hunger, thirst, and clothes. That's the very basics of life, and we all understand that. But then we move on to less material types of poverty. Jesus mentions being a stranger. So for us, this could be somebody new in town, or a student, a refugee, a migrant worker. It's anyone with no family or friends, and therefore no support network. And we would hope that the church would be the first port of call where these people could find a welcoming and friendly place. Jesus mentions those who are sick and in need of care, and we know a lot about that, and we're good on that in our church, but also those who are lonely and in prison with no one to visit them. And that we know less about. Yes, there is um, HMP Send, not far away from here. But there are other kinds of prisons, ones with no actual bars, but which hem us in and steal our liberty. Mental illness, addiction, behavior disorders, or the cruelty of others. So Jesus is giving us here a picture of holistic social action, and this is what he expects from us. He's also saying that we will be judged on how we meet people's needs across the spectrum, not just the basics. 
Now you might be thinking, what is Jill going on about? Because we already support six charities at, at St. Nicholas. We support youth work, we meet our parish share, we've got the meeting place, all kinds of activities. We're not made of money. But as I've said, money is not the only thing. Charitable donations are great, and I work for Oasis, and um, I handle those charitable donations, and they are much needed and appreciated. But there are some very ordinary things that we can do to meet people's needs and serve Jesus. Spending time with people, just going for a coffee, listening active, actively, Helping a neighbor with a problem. Maybe their child can't do their homework, but you can. Offering spare furniture on free cycle. Making sure a new visitor to church feels really welcome. And I wonder, in these months of COVID, whether it's these ordinary acts of neighborliness and friendship that are now the hardest to find. I'm just going to ask Kat to come and Give us a couple of examples of how this holistic approach, um, how you found that in your centre. Cat's Oasis Centre is in Hadley in northwest London. It couldn't be more different than Bookham <laughs> if, yeah, we, if we tried. <laughs> so w you've got a little example for us. Yes, so one of the activities that our team does is support a group uh, which is called the Knit and Natter. So this is some of our residents in the community who get together um, teach each other knitting, and it kind of reduces that isolation that people have. Um, we realised that during lockdown and during COVID, um, people were unable to meet and were having to stay home. And we also, through our network of knitting natterers, were made aware of a wider network of uh, some of the older residents who were unable to um, go out and get basic supplies such as shopping. So we coordinated um, sort of redistributing uh, donated food parcels and were able to make sure that lots of people in our community didn't go hungry. Um, as we went through and were able to start meeting again, we uh, started a luncheon club which is for some of our most isolated uh, residents in the community. They come together once a week and have a hot meal together. Um, and we've actually found that some of our younger people, like the children and young people, like to pop along as well. So um, I was made aware of a session two weeks ago where they were playing music, everybody was dancing. Um, so a really, really kind of whole community feeling. That's brilliant. So, knitting. <laughs> so, it all started with, with a knitting group. So, that is a lovely example, and one I think that we could uh, envisage happening. But what about that kind of poverty where there is no simple answer because it's systemic in our society, a very complex knot of problems? Not, lot, not a month ago, a boy of 15 at one of Oasis schools, he was a pupil of uh, Shirley Park School in Croydon, he was knifed by another teenage boy and died in Ashburton Park in Croydon. What circumstances led both of those boys to that tragedy? Millions of pounds are spent on violence reduction by local authorities, the police, and the community. Yet the number of young people murdered in London last year reached 30. That's a whole class in a school, if you look at it like that. What can our donations and indeed our prayers do in the face of this kind of poverty? Where does this fit in with Jesus' call to feed the hungry, care for the sick, and befriend the lonely? But again, there is hope. There are things that we can do. And Kat, you've got experience of helping people who are victims of youth violence. Do you want to tell us about that? Yes, so um, one of the projects that I work on is um, a violence reduction program where our youth workers are based within an A&E department at a busy North London hospital um, and we meet with young people who attend after being assaulted or victims of violence and um, there we met a young man called Tyler. Okay. Um, he was 15 at the time and we soon learned that he had been uh, victimised by a gang in his area 
um, to the point that he was frightened to leave the house. Um, he actually stayed out of education for six months um, before it was kind of picked up. And I think it's, it's a really, really sad story because unfortunately this young man just fell through the cracks. Um, but with our youth worker who started working with him, did a lot of work um, supporting the young man and the parent to get back into education. So over a period, um, we were able to secure uh, a place for this young man to go and do his GCSEs. Um, and he gradually built up the confidence to go out um, in, the, in the community, first with the youth worker. They started volunteering to walk uh, a dog, which took them out and, you know, to get the fresh air and build that confidence. Um, Finally, he was able to go and get some good GCSEs. Um, he wants to go into nursing or to be a police officer, um, and he's well on the way to achieving that. Thank you, Kat. So that's a story with a, a lot of hope um, in it. And there are other stories like that. And that's the kind of work that uh, St. Nicholas will be supporting over, over the coming years. So our takeaway point today is that Jesus makes a very clear call to us to care for the needs of others. That call may well be answered by supporting charities or by campaigning for change in our society, or it could be simple acts of kindness and a listening ear. Our job is to be on the lookout for which of those things God wants us to do. Truly, I tell you, Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Amen. Kat is um, youth and community, head of head youth, of youth and community, community. <laughs> <laughs> at Oasis Hub in Hadley. And we'll tell you more about Oasis when we get the slides. There we go. So you might recognize that man there, the Reverend Steve Chalk. He's an author and um, a pastor and the founder of Oasis Charitable Trust in 1985. Uh, it has 52 academies, those are schools, uh, giving education to 30,000 children. Uh, some of them are rather large, actually. <laughs> um, 39 community hubs. Community hubs are attached to the schools and they do a lot of community work. Some of them are so big, they are charities in their own right. And this is where CAT works in an Oasis Community Hub in Hadley. Also part of the trust is Stop the Traffic. That's an anti-human trafficking campaign, a housing association there, and Oasis Global works in Africa and India and Belgium and Kyrgyzstan. Don't tell me why uh, those particular countries. That's an overview of Oasis. So on the next slide, My official job title is Deputy Hub Leader. A youth support worker. I teach design technology. Chief Executive of Oasis Community Housing. The youth development outreach worker hyphen mental health specialist. I work with 11 to 24 year olds with issues around anger, aggression or violence. We house people who are sleeping rough without expecting them to jump through hoops. In North Bristol, I'm responsible for all of our community work. <laughs> It really hurts me to see people's potential being missed, whether that be young people or some of the families we work with. People that we serve and have experienced trauma, isolation, abuse, very often indifference. People don't see them. Lots of Oasis projects are about helping people take ownership in their community and actually help to transform the communities they live in. It's heartbreaking to hear some of the things that young people go through. I love seeing people do something or achieve something that they never realised they could do. We'll take on the school that's failing. We'll house the person that nobody else will. We get our hands dirty. It's this huge organization that branches into so many areas of life. Very much of a patchwork quilt. One body, but it's made of these different patches that have their own expression. We really are passionate about making a difference. When we say we love them, we mean it. My joy comes from knowing that I'm going to change the outcome of that young person's life. And even if I don't see it, I know that I planted the seed. I see it if I look out onto the street. I see it in the playgrounds in our academies. When you help one person, how that ripples out. It's about that sense of community. We encourage people to do the best that they can. When they succeed, it means we've succeeded as well. 
understanding everybody is worthy of being part of a community, that everybody has worth. It's really exciting to see people take a project and run with it to help them personally thrive and flourish and to help transform the town or the city that they live in. as part of uh, the very popular. So 39 community hubs committed to transforming communities, building places where people can reach their God-given potential. That's our um, strap line for Oasis. If you can see the next slide. Would you like to take over from here and tell us about yes. uh, Hadley? <laughs> um, so we're based in Enfield in North London, and we have two academies, and then we're part of the, the hub that's attached to the two academies. We've got one um, which has nearly 1,000 students, was actually the first um, Oasis Academy, that's in Enfield. And then Hadley is actually an all-through academy, so children can join at age two and stay with us up until the age of 19. Um, and there's 1,600 students uh, involved there, so quite a large uh, number of young people that we work with. Um, and then there's just a little bit of information about Enfield itself and the kind of context in which um, these people are growing up. Um, oh, could we go back one? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, looking at, um, we're situated, so Enfield is the very northernmost borough, and there's areas of it which are beautiful. You know, all the footballers live there, you know, Tottenham players, and um, the Tottenham training grounds then. But there is a road that divides Enfield, so it goes from central London all the way up to Hertfordshire, and on the east end of the borough, is where we see the highest levels of poverty and deprivation, and that's where our academies are situated. Um, and we know from the figures, uh, one in three children are living in poverty. And between the, the west and the east, there's a massive gap in terms of life expectancy and those health inequalities that affect uh, people. Next slide, please. So you can see there in the, in the red, that's the eastern end that I was talking about. Um, also, Enfield regularly crops up for some of the negative reasons. Um, I actually, um, where we see the figures on youth violence, Enfield across the whole of London uh, is consistently in the top one or two for levels of serious youth violence and uh, victims of crime. Um, and it is nationally the 11th highest uh, of child poverty. Yeah, next please. And then we also have a fantastic, really diverse borough. 49% um, of our children have uh, English as a second language. So um, that can sometimes present difficulties for um, children when they're in education and for work that we do with parents when there is that additional language barrier. So we have to be very resourceful in terms of how we can best um, meet the kind of communication needs of the parents that we're working with. Uh, next slide, please. So we are involved in quite a lot of different uh, projects. So when I first started, which is 10 years ago, I was uh, the youth worker. So there was one youth worker, it was me. I worked within the academies and also in the community. Um, over time, we've been really fortunate to be able to access grants um, and sort of charitable funds which have allowed our projects to grow in response to the needs that we're presented with. Um, so with the work that we do with young people, we take referrals for some of our students who are struggling the most uh, within school and the youth workers can meet them one-to-one -one during the school day to sit down and have a regular mentoring session with them. They can talk about anything that's going on at home, any difficulties that they have, difficulties in the community, um, and talk about their kind of dreams and aspirations and work really intensively with a youth worker, sort of set those goals and work towards them. Um, we also have a youth club, so we do after-school clubs uh, four days in the week, and on the fifth day, we do a junior club for our eight to 11-year-olds because we find that there's very little going on for that age group and actually we really understand that sometimes we might work with teenagers, but 
there's a lot that's happened and perhaps they're already a certain way down the road. Why can't we start working with people when they're younger to spot those early signs that things aren't going well and make sure that we can keep supporting them to achieve what they want to achieve in life? Next slide. So this is an example of a young woman I worked with whose name is Ayan. She was in year 10 and she was um, about to be excluded from the school. She was going through a difficult time at home. Um, now, our academy actually built uh, a, a sort of small alternative provision for those students that were struggling within the school, but who maybe another school would have expelled them and excluded them, and they would have ended up into uh, a pupil referral unit where we know sometimes that outcomes can be quite um, not so positive. Um, so we have our own alternative provision as a way of supporting people in a smaller group setting. Um, Ian started working there, and I worked with her every afternoon. So she had lessons in the morning, and I would uh, do positive activities in the afternoon. And we discovered she had a real love for football. So she started volunteering to lead football sessions with young people. Um, so by the time that she'd finished in year 11, she'd done over 100 hours of volunteering. Um, she actually got a reward to go and do a tour around the Emirates Stadium, and I had to go with her, oh. which was very unfortunate for me because I'm a Spurs fan. But nevertheless, <laughs> she had a fantastic time and got that recognition for all of her hard work. Um, she went on to college um, and is working towards um, a career in health and beauty. One of the really important things that we do is um, support for parents and uh, children. So we have a parent support worker, and I think every day for her it looks very different. She has, um, you know, from the moment the day starts, she's calling parents, she's finding out uh, why someone isn't in school, going home sometimes to help bring the children into school to support the parents. Um, she does, uh, in the holidays, activities for parents with not to 10-year-olds. So it's a whole family activity, and it's free. Um, they get a hot meal, and they get to go and do some really positive activities, supporting their parental, parental abilities. Um, and also, uh, as I mentioned earlier about the, the food distribution, we have a really good uh, relationship with a, a charity who collect all the food that would otherwise have gone to waste from the, the supermarkets and the restaurants and they give us a delivery, and we're able to redistribute those every week. So actually, we have about 70 people come uh, lining up the road to come and, and access some free food. OK, next slide. And Shall so, we, we leave that one? Are we Do we just give on, on to the next one? Sorry, I could right. talk quite a lot about <laughs> this. <laughs> um, so one of our projects, um, as mentioned, is we have the, the youth work that takes place within the A&E. Well, that's our point of meeting the young people but then the real work takes place in the community at any location that, is, that they feel safe. Um, and we work in an intensive, ongoing way, and the support is tailored completely around that person and what their needs are. Next slide. Do we, do we yes, we'll, we'll skip that yes. one as well. <laughs> right, your message about <laughs> what we need. Yes, so um, one of the things that we've noticed is that we, uh, when we're working with young people, sometimes if they have something that they want to get involved with or access and they just don't have the money to do it. I mean, even a young man that I was working with, um, he wanted to go to college, they had to pay five pounds, his parents had to pay five pounds for him to get an Oyster card and they didn't have that money. And whilst we can support small one-off things like that, there's a, a greater need. We had a young person that we're working with who's just turned 18. Um, he was tragically stabbed in the heart in a gang-related um, attack, and he was moved on to our borough. Now, when he was 17, this took place about a year ago, when he was 17, there was lots of support for him, um, but now he's just turned 18. He's um, had to move out of the family home and he's been housed in emergency accommodation, but when he turned up at the flat with his youth worker, it's, it's empty, it, there's nothing in there. So we really need to find a way to be able to give support to people moving into this emergency accommodation to buy towels and bedding and a kettle. Um, this has come up on a number of occasions with young people we work with, and there just isn't the means to be able to support that immediate need. Um, and also, uh, things like there's a young man that we're working with. He is 14. 
he's been arrested and um, he wants to make a change in his life. He's actually got in with a group of young people who've got him involved in, in an offence. Now, we think that it's not too late for him uh, to make those positive choices and something he's always wanted to do is learn to play the piano. So we would love to be able to support him to have some piano lessons so he could really start feeling that sense of purpose, that sense of achievement. Um, and that's the kind of things that really help support our kind of wider work and the young people that we're working with. Okay, that's brilliant. And that is where the donations from St. Nicholas will, will be going towards those, that kind of project. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all so much for your support and for your time. Yes, big thank you to Kat, who's travelled quite a way to come to us today. Kat, thank you very much for doing that. We do appreciate that. Um, I just want to do something quickly, which is slightly unrelated to what we've been hearing about, but we want to take advantage of the fact that Jill is here this morning. Uh, many of you, if not all of you, will know that Jill is undertaking ordination training at the moment. And all being well, God willing, uh, Jill will be ordained on the 3rd of July, I think now in Guildford Cathedral. Yes, in Guildford. Um, so that's something to be praying towards. Uh, Jill is currently on placement. It might not look like it because she's here this morning, but she's actually uh, in Effingham and Little Bookham, uh, seeing how they do things. Uh, and we are encouraged to pray for Jill as a church going on that placement. She began it already because that fitted in well with them. Uh, but nevertheless, I think we want to pray for Jill. So Jill, that's what I'm doing here. And we're going to pray for you. So as you remain seated, let's pray. Jill, may God bless your ministry. May you serve him with joy and know his strength in times of difficulty. May it be a rich opportunity to learn as well as to give to others. And may it help equip you for all that will be needed in your future ministry. And so as we pray for Jill, so let's pray for ourselves. Almighty God, by whose grace alone we are accepted and called to your service. Strengthen us by your Holy Spirit and make us worthy of our calling through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well done, Jill. Well done. Thanks again, Kat. And I think we're going to pray. So someone kind is coming to lead us in our prayers. Julia, thank you very much. Almighty God and Father, help us to be still in your presence, that we may know ourselves to be your people and you to be our God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, who formed the family of mankind to live in harmony and peace, we acknowledge before you our divisions, quarrels, hatreds, injustices and greed. May your church demonstrate before the world the power of the gospel to destroy divisions so that in Christ Jesus there may be no barriers of wealth or class, age or intellect, race or color, but all may be equally your children, members of one another and heirs together of your everlasting kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. In these unsettling times, Lord, when we are beset by conflict on every side, we pray for our government, asking that you will give to all in positions of authority a spirit of integrity, of honesty, and of dedication to the greater good, that all may be guided along the path of righteousness to do your will and to live according to your word. We pray for our Queen as she fast approaches the anniversary of her accession to the throne 70 years ago, and we give you thanks for her grace and her wisdom. We pray that she may always be a source of strength and inspiration to her people, and that she will continue to promote your honor and glory as she has during her long reign. Comfort her, O Lord, during the difficult times which beset her, and bless her and her family 
as they seek to support her in the role to which you called her so many years ago. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the life of our church, thinking especially today of Celeste Rios in her role of family and children's minister, asking that you will fill her with energy and inspiration to do her work, your work to her honor and glory. Bless her too, Lord, in the part she is playing in the church development plan and its focus on contact with our church family. We pray for our neighbors who live and work in the Grange Center, giving you thanks for their presence among us. Lord, we ask for your blessing on each one of them and for Alison, Dawn, Pam, Nicholas, Daniel, Cherry, and Simon, all members of our electoral roll. Please help us all, Lord, to be good neighbors to one another, to respect each other despite our differences, and to love you as you love us. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Loving Father, Please be with all who are having to cope with illness in any way. We think especially today of Eldred, Tony, Valerie, Jeff, Richard, Deborah, Peggy and Tim. But remember also any others known to us personally. Bless and help each one of them, we pray. Be with them in their adversity and with those who care for them and give them all the strength to cope with what lies ahead. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we remember before you Sheila Foote and Carol Westwood, giving thanks for their lives and for all that they achieved. We pray for their families and friends asking that they may be comforted in their loss and to know that they are not alone, you are with them and your loving arms surround them now and always. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. 